Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have an exciting and timely topic to discuss. Our webinar is entitled Understanding Cyber Threats to State and Local Government. Um, should make for a timely, a lively discussion. My name is Ed Fierro. I'm your host and moderator today. I am Senior Counsel in Bracewell's Houston office. I work primarily with state and local governments in connection with public finance transactions. I also have a regulatory practice or advise broker dealers and municipal advisors on regulatory issues. I'm joined today by Phil Bazinson. <coughs> excuse me, Bazinson. Uh, he's a managing partner in our Seattle office. Phil helps clients navigate some of the most complicated litigation, regulatory enforcement, and incident response challenges. Phil also has counseled many clients in connection with cyber-related incidents. Also joining us today is David Springer, out of our Austin office. David also represents clients in litigation disputes and government investigations. We're all very much excited to be here today. Before we get started, let's take care of a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the comment box on the right of the screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. If we run out of time, we'll respond in a follow-up email. Most importantly, for many of you, this webinar has been approved for CLE credit from the State Bar of Texas and New York. If you'd like to request MCLE credit, we'll give you an opportunity to do so in a follow-up email. Uh, now, let's get started. First, first, we're going to discuss recent risk. In this portion of the presentation, we're going to identify the threats to state and local governments. Next, we're going to discuss the impact of cyber attacks. In this portion of the presentation, we really want everyone to understand the possible impacts to the state and local government as a whole, look beyond the impact to the IT infrastructure and cost. Lastly, we'll discuss the importance of preparation. This is where we'll discuss developing a response plan, training, and other measures. Now I'll hand it off to Phil in Seattle to discuss recent risk. All right, thanks, Ed, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, I just want to also start out by saying that, as, as I understand it, in our audience today, we have a, a fairly uh, diverse background of experiences and roles that people play in um, assessing cybersecurity response plans and preparedness. I think there are probably some people who have stronger technical backgrounds. Uh, there are others who are more focused on legal issues. So uh, for some of you, some of this may be a little bit basic. For others, it'll be new, and then it may swap around as we get later on into the presentation. Uh, but we want to make sure, at least as we talk about recent risks, that everybody's familiar with um, the, the more common risks, um, and we're going to introduce them through some, some basic uh, recent examples. And uh, part of the reason we're doing that is that once you have a core understanding of these risks, it'll help provide context for the preparation options that we're going to discuss later. So the first threat that I want to talk about a little bit is ransomware. Um, this is really common in companies and other organizations and has become more and more common with public entities as well and, and, and in a number of pretty alarming high-profile examples. Uh, at its core, a ransomware attack is really a quick cash grab by hackers that generally seek manageable amounts uh, that, can, that are affordable to pay. If you see you know, on the slide here, uh, the hacker is asking for $300 worth of Bitcoin. So in a sense, a lot of ransomware attacks are priced at sort of nuisance value. Um, because the, the, the hackers making the ransom demand want to get paid, um, and they're smart, and they've done assessments and realize that um, it can be more cost effective to pay them than to actually fight the problem. Um, one of the things that, that we note here, and, and we'll discuss a little bit more later, is how does, a, how does a ransomware attack show up and how do some of these other threats that we'll discuss show up? Um, really the most basic things to think about are emails, email attachments, opening unfamiliar websites, um, doing work with third parties where third parties gain access to networks, uh, particularly commercial vendors that may not uh, have as robust cybersecurity mechanisms in place to defend them 
from from outside attacks and and um, you know these are things that that we'll talk about particularly in the context of planning and preparation and and training in in a little bit um, in specific you know I think the thing to think about with with ransomware through you know the the example that we have this on the screen right now is is that you know the outsiders try to um, access and shut down systems that uh, you know are costly to repair that are costly to reboot they're costly to work around and uh, they do this in high volume it's not that uh, hackers focus on specific and only large targets uh, as our, our experience has shown us that they cast a fairly wide net and aim for a somewhat low penetration success rate, but uh, they do it often enough that when they succeed and ask for a you know, significant but not insurmountable dollar amount, you know, the path of least resistance uh, certainly can be to pay it. It's certainly also uh, something that doesn't require as much uh, disclosure or discussion or public outcry if you know essential government services are restored quickly because a payment is made rather than uh, having services go down for a pro prolonged period of time and attract uh, negative attention. So th this is kind of what what the background is on ransomware. David, do you want to talk a little bit about business email compromise schemes? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about how this kind of scheme works and then why it's a very prominent vulnerability for the public finance sector in particular. Um, and to give credit where credit's due, this graphic comes from the FBI. So step one in this scheme is organized crime groups, who are usually the perpetrator, develop essentially a targeting package on corporate executives or municipal officials or others trying to understand what's going on within the entity, how it works, who gives directions, who are the finance people that actually send it. And the reconnaissance portion is a very big part of it. And especially the organized organized crime groups uh, that perpetrate these really invest the time and resources to do a good amount of research. And that increases their success rate. So Step two is grooming. I think probably almost everybody on this call has gotten one of these very uh, low effort, full of typos and misspellings. Hey, wire money to this thing. And of course, when that comes out of the blue from a suspicious Gmail address and is full of typos and a completely implausible story, very few people fall for that. We're not even really just talking about those. You know, this is different. You know, in these kind of schemes, there's uh, generally a the the perpetrators put that research that they've collected to use. And there's a grooming process where they generally start off with a very innocuous, easy ask that looks like it's coming from a senior leader of an organization uh, that doesn't really raise a lot of eyebrows. It's not an initial first email saying transfer a half million dollars to this wire uh, account. You know, they kind of get the conversation going. Maybe they start it with, hey, I left my computer at the office. Uh, can we talk about a few budget documents now? because uh, I don't have you know my normal uh, email right in front of me. And then sometimes this happens over days and weeks. These are pretty sophisticated. Then once the uh, perpetrator has felt like they've kind of set the groundwork for this, they move to an exchange of information. So once the victim is convinced uh, that they are you know conducting legitimate business with somebody who's authorized to tell them what to do, Generally, you know, the person on the receiving end of this is, you know, kind of a junior accounting or finance person and the perpetrator is posing as CEO or city controller or, you know, somebody more senior. And then they'll say kind of, oh, you know, by the way, we're closing this transaction or we're about to consummate this deal. Here's the wiring instructions. Uh, everything's set up. Go for it. And the person on the receiving end of that email generally thinks it's pretty legitimate and you know, you'd be surprised how often actually executes a transaction. And then of course, step four is the actual wire transfer. The funds are uh, steered towards a bank account controlled by uh, criminals and not by the actual counterparty. And a quick aside on this, uh, we're gonna talk about insurance a little bit later, uh, but this actually recent, ha recently happened to a law firm, not our law firm, but another one, uh, where a big deal was happening and some very sophisticated criminals kind of understood the deal flow and where they were in it. 
and send an email to a junior associate saying, okay, deal's done. Please wire $4 million uh, to, to the bank at this, at this uh, number. And the junior associate dutifully, you know, late in the evening said, okay, it looks legitimate. This is exactly the right time from the right person and sent it. Now, here's the insurance part of the story. This law firm then claimed against their, in, their cyber insurance policy saying, we've been the victim of a hack, a victim of a cyber attack. And the insurance company came back and said, no, you've been a victim of fraud. You know, this, this was done via email, but this is just fraud. It's, it's not a cyber incident. Obviously, for the purposes of our presentation, we think this is a, a cyber threat, but uh, and every insurance policy is going to be different. We'll get into that, but it's kind of an interesting aside. Yeah, David, this is this is it. I'd like to add to that a little bit. I, I know uh, in connection with um, um, a bond financing, I was aware of a, you know one of these uh, these hackers was able to basically groom um, a uh, I guess a, it was a part of the investment bank, and they were able to compromise um, and circulate a revised copy of the closing memorandum and uh, at closing funds were wired to uh, a routing number and account number that weren't the uh, intended parties. And uh, in connection with my bond practice, I see this, you know, funds being exchanged all the time. Uh, lot, you know, it's a lot of money. I think it's really important for uh, working groups to remain diligent, you know, if and when something runs runs afoul or doesn't look right, it, it's, it's important to, you know, follow up and, and really talk to the parties that are involved in the transaction. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, one thing, uh, one easy way, and we'll get to some preparation or mediation steps later, but one good practice that a lot of uh, firms and governments and businesses have started using is instituting a phone call verification rule of before you send money, you need to pick up the phone and call the person you think is authorizing it and double check. So moving on to why the public uh, finance sector is at particular risk here, it, the clearest answer is the open records laws. Um, you know, when a organized crime group is per is perpetrating this against uh, a large company or a law firm, there is generally some hacking involved or, or, you know, a lot more nefarious activity behind the scenes because they've got to know who's involved in the deal, what the timeline is, when money's changing hands uh, and kind of who what people sound like when they type emails, what their what their cadence is to try to do a good job. And so public records makes this easier. It doesn't, it doesn't make it uh, dead simple and there's still things hackers kind of need to risk and assume and, and take educated guesses at, but it's really easy for them to acquire a huge data set of emails from the CFO of a particular entity and see how that person writes and do they shorten their name from David to Dave and make these emails way more believable and you know, true to form than your average spear phishing thing that we all see all the time. Um, and that not only do they are they able to uh, get a better sense of what the uh, person they're portraying acts like via email, but they also have better insight into the timing of a deal uh, through the RFP process and all kinds of public notifications. There's a much greater public awareness of the acquisition timetable or the life cycle of some of these transactions in the public sector, and uh, the criminals can kind of position and time their uh, efforts in a, in a very uh, well-targeted fashion that's going to seem very logical in the deal flow and, and when this is happening. And, you know, this is a very different threat profile than some uh, public company, I'm sorry, some private companies where, you know, they don't need to publish all this. And in fact, a lot of the transactions, the public doesn't even know it's happening at a time. So it's much more difficult. And this is one of many places in the cybersecurity realm where, nobody's going to have perfect defenses or be able to defend against every one of these threats all the time. But in some ways you just need to be, you don't, you need to, you know, run faster than the slowest person running away from the problem or your locks need to be a little bit better than the next city over because hackers want to do this on the cheap. Uh, some of them are actually kind of lazy and they're going to look for the easiest mark, the easiest way to do this. And if a particular entity is not very easy, chances are they'll just move on to the next one where they can access all this information or have better insight into the deal flow. Yeah, you know, David, this is Phil. Uh, one other comment on this, well, two, maybe two closely related comments. One is, you know, because so many public entities have transparency expectations to share with, you know, the public at large, not just through open records requests, but, you know, affirmatively share, you know, when, 
uh, new financial arrangements are being contemplated and who counterparties might be and how uh, financial transactions are evaluated, that uh, it, it, it really is a question of when rather than if because so much uh, information is available, which is why uh, having a good uh, preparation plan in place uh, that's tested can can really be so important. I mean, one of the things that is uh, just vital on the business uh, email compromise scheme front, you know, many wire transactions can be reversed or caught within the first, you know, 24, 36 hours, um, which is why, you know, having the, the call verification is so important, even if, uh, even if a wire goes out, that, uh, you know, if it goes out to the wrong place, the wrong bank account, they can be reversed. Banks are very good at uh, responding quickly. The FBI is very good at responding quickly. But if a improper wire is sent out and not caught for, you know, a couple of days, then it's much, much, much harder to walk that back, to claw it back. Um, so, so that's why being being diligent and having a good preparation plan is uh, is so important. Thanks, Bill. So, kind of one final note on the email compromise scheme. So. This isn't a presentation about voting, it's a presentation about finance, uh, and a voting security uh, presentation would be at least a full hour in of itself. But we want to make one point here. So the interconnectedness of public systems within a particular municipality is something that's going to make one part of the organization more vulnerable uh, because of what else is going on. So there's strong recent evidence in a number of places, not the least of which is uh, Special Counsel Mueller's uh, recent report, that hackers from around the world did breach a number of election uh, systems during the last uh, presidential election cycle. Now, what do we mean by election systems? It's very, very difficult to hack at any large scale the literal machines where people are casting ballots and change that around. That's hard to do, and that's kind of a topic for another day. But what's actually easier and what there is evidence that has happened repeatedly, not even just in the last election, election is getting into kind of the, the underlying systems, voter registration databases, the email accounts of the county and county officials who run elections, uh, all this kind of peripheral stuff that facilitates smooth elections. And, you know, that messing with that, uh, can really undermine public confidence in a municipality, not to mention, uh, you know, the whole uh, system of government or the a system of election. And why this is relevant to public finance is because a lot of times hackers are looking for a foothold into a system. And especially given all the news reporting on, on uh, you know, voting systems over many years now and potential vulnerabilities, security there is increasing fast. But a you know, somebody who's involved in municipal bond issuance might not be quite as on alert to opening links and, and spear phishing emails that have all kinds of malicious software. And what sophisticated hackers are doing is, is kind of back to what I said on a different point a minute ago, is they're looking for the weakest link and being able to get into a municipality's system through somebody who's not on guard because they don't feel like their job is going to really draw the interest of a very sophisticated hacking operation. Frequently, those are the people who actually open the door and uh, once the hackers are in, it's easy for them to kind of laterally move across the network uh, to other parts of it. So just wanted to briefly note that, but obviously this isn't a, a presentation about elections. So moving over to data breaches, which is another uh, risk, of course. Uh, this, this is another risk that receives a lot of attention, primarily with uh, public companies. But it, it, it's not just a risk that, that companies face. Um, recently, it's become much more common uh, for public entities to be targets. And uh, you know, one additional area that uh, is particularly relevant in public institutions uh, that we've seen a lot of in the last year, 18 months, I guess, is hackers targeting research institutions. Um, this has become uh, sort of a hot item for hackers seeking intellectual property for seeking uh, access to cutting edge research and other areas that can be monetized in the developing world or can be used um, to essentially create um, 
you know, competitive products that would undermine uh, products that uh, U.S. companies are trying to sell abroad. Um, you know, the uh, I will note actually, David pointed out this yesterday. The way the slides are formatted, Bracewell's name appears on the footer of just about all of them. Do not take Bracewell here as you know one of the high-end, uh, high-profile data breach victims. I think that's what appears on all of our slides. So um, we're not a data breach poster child. The, uh, there is, however, a, a, a good stirring uh, municipal example that's happened many, many times over in California. Um, in California recently, there were over almost 50 different municipal breaches in smaller, mid-sized uh, areas. Uh, in those cases, the uh, code that was inserted into the Click2Gov software captured payment card data that included names, addresses, email addresses, payment card numbers, um, expiration dates, security codes, you know, a whole wide, wide range of customer information and you know, in in one of the nearly 50 breaches, um, you know, roughly 2,400 people were reportedly affected. All in, as you see here, nearly 300,000 payment records were reportedly stolen and then uh, put up for resale on the dark web, which is you know a, a market for all kinds of identity theft uh, material. This is obviously a, a risk to any enterprise, and certainly when you have uh, public entities that are requesting or preferring having uh, residents make municipal and similar payments online, uh, having the integrity of those systems challenged and in this case breached is, is a real risk and uh, causes all kinds of uh, rippling trouble that uh, Ed is going to talk about in just a moment. So Ed, do you want to take yeah. over and talk about some of the impact? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks, uh, Bill. So, now let's move on to talk about the potential impacts of cyber attacks on state and local governments. Uh, to start, I think many of us tend to think cyber attacks is affecting IT infrastructure. I, I know when I worked at the uh, at the government, I was I always thought that I was several layers removed from the effects of any cyber attack. Uh, basically, meaning any attack would simply impact the IT department and the uh, infrastructure. Uh, I found out then and now that. Uh, an attack could impact many different areas of a government entity. Um, so the reality is uh, attacks could, are much broader than that. They could impact physical infrastructure, cost, creditworthiness, uh, political risk, and even decrease, decrease public trust. Um, the next slide really is a, is a key finding. Uh, it's a study that was done by IBM, and really the, the big picture takeaway here is uh, you know, the cost of a cyber attack has increased and will continue to increase. We could see in 2013, uh, the numbers uh, increased 15% 2016 uh, per record and per incident 29% um, from 2013 to 2016. So the, the, the data out there is staggering as far as the cost uh, to entities that experience a data breach. Um, I think I'll go ahead and hand it over to uh, David now to talk about the credit risk, which a lot of you are probably uh, concerned about on this call. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, so as Ed mentioned, there's often a tendency to you know think of cyber issues as cabin to the cyber environment, to the IT environment. But one real risk here, especially for this crowd, is credit rating. So there's been a lot of media reports over the last year or so um, citing the credit rating agencies and saying that the agencies are really starting to pay more attention to this. You know, Moody's has said it's going to start building uh, the risk of a business ending hack in CNBC's terms, uh, CNBC's words, into their credit ratings. Um, and this should really come as no surprise. You know, it's, it's something that uh, is important to disclosure and it's something that's important to literal finance. Um, but going to the next slide here, you, you know, the public finance industry is one that's going to get a very close look at this because it affects a number it affects it in a number of different ways so first of all no municipal issuer has been downgraded to date that we know of uh, but as s p global ratings has said the very nature of public finance attracts criminals looking for an easy target 
that's what we were getting at a little bit earlier in this in the presentation. And now, of course, literal insolvency and ability to pay the cost that Ed was just talking through of you know remediation and rebuilding. Obviously, that factors in, but we think there's a lot more at play when it comes to the public sector. Uh, disclosure and trust is a big part of this. Of if the risks of this aren't made uh, clear to investors and the rating agencies and the public, you know, there's all kinds of uh, things that flow from that, not the least of which is eroding public confidence. And as issuers go back to seek refinancing or new bonds or new approval for new debt, uh, the, the cyber attack itself, uh, the cost of responding, and the uh, whether or not people felt like they understood the risk is really going to affect the ability to raise more money the next time around. Um, and you know, as I think S and P Global has pointed out, at least one or two different places. There's a political blowback to this, too. It, it, people losing confidence in their elected officials to manage big, financially significant incidents like this very well could make them less willing to approve new debt or, or refinancing of debt. And, uh, you know, again, there's not been an example of this, but we think it's only a matter of time. Uh, it's hard to put exact parameters on what is going to be so substantial or probably more likely it's not one particular incident, it's a series of incidents that demonstrates that a particular municipality isn't putting the time and effort into these cyber resources. And after two or three incidents in the same place of uh, probably escalating severity, you know, that really, it would not surprise us at all if that starts having a meaningful impact on credit ratings. And one final point on this for me is, you know, there's a term called hacktivism that some of you might be familiar with. And that's you know, most of what we've talked about here today is financial crimes, and that certainly is the biggest threat uh, this industry is facing. But there's really a threat too from people that are just worked up uh, about political issues. And hacktivism is kind of hacking for a for an activist role, a political activism role. And you know, even things as minor as just defacing a public website of a of a municipality, which doesn't have any real impact on uh, the organization's ability to conduct business for the most part. But it really just chips away at people's confidence in it. And that's a very low cost thing to do. And uh, public finance issuers are at a real risk of that because there are plenty of companies out there that are kind of just nameless, faceless organizations. But as this audience knows probably better than I do, you know, the, your citizens and your voters can get pretty worked up about an issue. And it kind of injects a whole new, a whole new reason for why people might be trying to undermine, you know, that being the whole reason that they're doing this, trying to undermine the confidence in, in a government. So moving on uh, to kind of a, another brief one that we'll cover, we could do a whole CLE on this too. Is there a risk to physical infrastructure? In the same way that hackers may target uh, municipal finance employees as a way to eventually get over to voting systems. There have been many reported, credibly reported incidents of uh, mainly foreign nations targeting American physical infrastructure over the years. And now most of the operations that have been noted in the media so far haven't gone to the step of actually causing failure or causing some big incident, but it's foreign hackers getting caught laying the groundwork to do that and positioning some, themselves to do so if and when they want to. Uh, a group of Iranians was indicted about a year and a half ago for accessing the industrial control system of a dam in upstate New York. Uh, that got a fair amount of press, but it's one of many examples. There's a lot of press reports about Russian hackers uh, laying the groundwork and mapping uh, a lot of energy sector infrastructure. So, you know, according to uh, media reports that in the future, if something happened, they've already got that. And so, Obviously, the Department of Homeland Security and a lot of national security agencies are, are very involved in all this, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but it comes back to this kind of weak link point and the potential that not all threats facing municipal finance employees are directly tied to municipal finance. Some of them are tied to the fact that you're an important employee of a very large city that does a lot of important things and controls a lot of physical infrastructure. And of course, compared to the other threats and risks and uh, impacts we've talked about, that this is obviously at the very high end of that. 
this isn't a financial thing. This is a destructive thing, physically trying to destroy infrastructure and create chaos. So uh, we want to note that, that that's on the table. It's part of this conversation. And, you know, I'll add one one other point on the uh, Iranian hacking, uh, the dam in upstate New York situation. Uh, when, if you dig into the, the details of that uh, incident, you'll see that the uh, the locality was actually very fortunate that at the time uh, the network was penetrated by the hackers, that the uh, dam physically was um, had certain items taken offline for maintenance and that there were people actually in place on the ground near uh, certain important safety points that were able to manually override uh, some of the potential harm that could have been caused by the hackers. So in that case, uh, you know, the the people on the ground were very fortunate that timing uh, worked to their favor. Certainly, you know, one could, without much trouble, imagine a much worse case scenario, um, which, you know, obviously is, is why people are so attentive and concerned about this issue and, and why it, it makes sense that if there are large infrastructure uh, elements that have significant health, safety, and environment components to them, that they be included uh, with a, 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 a response plan and that uh, the, the security infrastructure that's in place to protect it is, is updated, maintained, and, and done so diligently. Thanks, Phil. And a closing point on this part of the uh, presentation before we move on to the next section is we're not trying to just scare you, We, especially some of these physical threats. I mean, these are very high-end threats that a lot of very smart people are paying very close attention to. And we're not trying to say it's as easy as if, you know, a CFO or a, you know, controller at an organization clicks a bad link, all of a sudden the dam's going to blow up. It's obviously not that simple. And the technical folks on this call know that. But it is something that's an important part of it's an important part of the puzzle of, of fitting this all together and thinking about where public finance fits in the cybersecurity world. So moving on to the importance of preparation, we have a number of things we want to walk through about ways to mitigate some of these threats, and if worse comes to worse, how to respond and deal with the fallout. So one of the first things is actually incredibly basic, but often overlooked. Uh, just basic device hygiene. So we all have seen on our iPhones or Androids that little red dot that asks you to update software. Uh, my wife hates doing it because she thinks it's always going to ruin all the features on her phones. It drives me crazy to see that little red dot there. But it's, it's important because it's not just new Animojis and, you know, and, and Bitmojis that are coming on your phone with each update. There's o almost always important security patches in there. And a lot of them are, are quite critical. And we keep coming back to this point because it's an important point, but that a lot of times hackers are looking for the cheapest, easiest entry point to do something. And if you have an up-to-date operating system and up-to-date apps and up-to-date security patches, that doesn't solve everything. It doesn't make you immune to any threat out there, but it actually makes you a much harder target to access than somebody who isn't doing this very basic, very easy thing uh, and a lot of times people will, hackers will just move on to the next person who hasn't updated their device in a year, and it's just an easier, lower cost thing for them to do. So Phil mentioned in one of our very first slides, the WannaCry malware, which was a terrible ransomware attack that happened around the world a little over a year ago, locked down tens of thousands of computers around the, the globe, cost hundreds of, I think millions of dollars in ransom payments, and that's not even counting the the payments for people uh, or the cost of people who didn't pay the ransom and just rebuilt their systems. But the interesting note on that, and a lot of the information security people that are on this call will understand this, the, a patch came out for that from Microsoft. Uh, it was a vulnerability in Microsoft software about two months before the first system was infected with this malware. So for about two months, Microsoft had publicly said on their website, hey, here's the software you can download and install. You know, this is a vulnerability out there, and if you install this, it won't affect you. And that, yet two months later, tens of thousands of systems all over the world were still infected by this terrible ransomware because they hadn't been updated. Now, last point on this is this is easier said than done. It, it's very easy for you to open your iPhone right now and make sure the software is up to date, which I would encourage you to do after this call. But I want to, you know, 
be kind to all our friends in the IT world, this is a little hard. This is certainly harder to do at scale. If you're managing 10,000 devices, if you're managing all kinds of servers, I have sympathy for a lot of the the systems administrators who fell victim to WannaCry, and you know had people making fun of them for saying, "Hey, this was patched two months ago. We shouldn't have fallen victim to this." But of course, you know, in large organizations dealing with thousands of machines, it is harder to push this out. Um, your IT people certainly have thought about this. This isn't news to them. But we want to reinforce that some of the steps to make you a little bit of a harder target and increase the chances that somebody who's targeting you will just move on to the city next door uh, are actually pretty basic and low cost. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Phil to talk about some other things. So as we segue into a uh, preparation and response plan, David, I have a question for you. My iPhone has asked if uh, I should enable two-factor two authentication. What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea. Uh, that's one of the other relatively low-cost, easy things to do. Is So two-factor authentication, most people probably know what this is, but it's generally something you know and something you have. It's two different simultaneous parallel ways to access something. So the typical example is you type your password into your bank website, and then it says, okay, we also sent you a text to your cell phone, enter that too. And that is a really, really good way to just make it a lot harder to people to get into your system. So anytime, even in your personal life, you have an option to do that. I would strongly encourage you to do it. Like anything in the cyber world, it's not perfect. It's not going to make you immune from any attack. If somebody really wants to get in, there are ways around it but it really goes a long way in making you a harder target. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll do that when we're done. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, the next piece that I want to talk a little bit about is uh, preparation and, and developing response plans. This is, again, this is a fairly brief overview and one could spend hours and hours going into the details of how to develop a response plan and uh, distill it and train on it and practice it and update it. But I think the, the key things to think about in developing a plan and, and what to do with the plan is, you know, identify the stakeholders within the organization and outside the organization. Clearly define what roles they play in responding to any sort of cyber incident. Um, make it easy to understand how members of the response plan can contact one another particularly when networks are down, um, having actual things like uh, secure li landlines or uh, you know, other methods of communication, knowing where people are, knowing how to get in touch with them is, is, is important. Um, another thing that, that a lot of organizations do and have been doing more is really identifying what uh, the organization's most important data is and how it can be protected and sealed off and in many cases whether or not it makes sense to have a duplicate set of that data that's uh, protected and kept offline and then periodically updated um, you know on the on the point of backup data that that can be used offline or accessed offline after after an attack certainly in the you know post september 11th world uh, quite a few federal government entities uh, started keeping key data on secure drives that are were, you know, stored in safes that you know could be accessed and tapped into if you know all kinds of networking was down or inaccessible. Um, another thing that can be very helpful for organizations of all sizes is you know once you have a response plan, these response plans can be lengthy and voluminous and for many of you may sit in a you know, colorful three ring binder on a shelf and when the actual incident happens, it, it, it's not the easiest thing to get to the binder and to you know, pour through it and to figure out exactly what to do. So what I, I often talk to organizations about is taking that, that binder full of information and distilling it down to you know, the equivalent of a you know, football game day play sheet that can be you know, one, maybe large, but one piece of paper that's got the most important information on it, that has kind of an information flow diagram of what happens in the first 15 minutes, what happens 
15 minutes later, what happens later that day, and so forth, really mapping out, you know, how to respond within the first few hours up through, you know, the first few days. Um, what you do with that then, uh, you know, ideally, is practicing incident response, going through drills. You can do this internally or with outside consultants that, you know, run you through scenarios where, uh, uh, hackers have penetrated systems and certain things have been shut down or uh, made inaccessible and you go through the drill and see how it works and you evaluate the response and make updates to the plan and you know like any other exercise you know sometime later you train again and you go through it so you become familiar and comfortable with with the response one, one of the other things that uh, is really important is having not just the internal, and I, I, I alluded to this a moment ago, not just the internal stakeholders contact information available, but having external stakeholders uh, information available as well. And that's not just, um, you know, consultants or counterparties or, you know, other officials within the, the government entity. It's knowing who at the FBI to contact, knowing who at Homeland Security to contact. Um, knowing who at uh, various banking relationships may be uh, important to contact and letting those people know that they are your contacts. So, you know, any late night, early morning call out of the blue doesn't take everybody completely by surprise. Um, you know, thinking about the next thing to do as part of a response plan is training. That's not just the core people who are responsible for responding. It's really anyone throughout the organization. Um, you know, the way I, I like to talk about it or think about this is you know, the, the best kind of training is one that speaks to behavior modification. Uh, and that, that works for every individual throughout an organization. And again, you can only really modify behavior through practice. Um, you know, I had a discussion with a uh, sort of an academic who writes about uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, and he was talking about um, you know protecting online reputations as something like you know you have the flu, you want to get a flu shot to uh, become inoculated, and that's kind of what training is like. And and we we talked about that a little bit, and then it dawned on us that that that's not really the right analogy um, because with responding to potential cyber attacks, it's not getting a flu shot and then thinking you've been inoculated. It's really like going to the doctor and getting told that, you know what, you should probably go on a diet and you should probably exercise more. And that doesn't mean having one healthy meal and running a few laps later that afternoon. It's really an all, all the time thing. And, you know, if you, if you, if you train about it and think about it and are responsive to things like, um, you know, assessing emails from business email uh, compromise schemes that and, and having multi-factor authentication, that's kind of the everyday nature of, of becoming familiar with this. And, and um, I can give you a, another sort of personal example here of, a, of an email compromise attempt that was thwarted um, not so long ago, uh, a, a hacker or, or some nefarious character spoofed my work email address, emailed my assistant and asked her to buy, you know, $500 iTunes gift cards for clients. And that, you know, the person pretending to be me asked that she email all the redemption codes to that email address, which was, you know, a fake email address. Now, um, thankfully, my, my assistant knows me well enough to know what my, you know, gift giving habits and preferences are. So she said, there's no way he's buying $500 iTunes gift cards for anybody. Um, she smelled the rat and said, no, this is, this is, there's something funny here. Um, but it, it's a great example that, that we've used now internally as the kind of simple, basic stuff where people who aren't, you know, on the front lines of dealing with hackers, uh, get identified as potentially ripe targets for hackers. Um, so that's all of that stuff is, is, is part of what training can be used for. One other 
thing that's part of preparation that that has become fairly common and and I imagine there are people who are who have dialed in who are, who are familiar with with this well very well is uh is cyber insurance um it this is an industry that's grown dramatically in the last you know five or ten years it's become much much more sophisticated and very common uh for a lot of um industries so some things to think about in addition to the positives um because insurance certainly can be a, a positive safety net is because the cyber issues can be a little bit different um policies are structured a little bit differently from what uh you know people who are unaware might might expect and i know david referred to uh one of the cyber insurance concerns a little bit earlier about you know fraud versus a cyber attack um frequently carriers who offer cyber insurance will you know want reps and warranties from their covered entities when made in an application that that speak to you know responsibilities to update and maintain systems and that security practices are uh kept up to speed that another thing that david mentioned that all patches security patches are installed at, in a timely fashion and that all you know devices that an organization issues will be covered by the security programs that are in place um you know the whether or not business email compromise schemes are covered by cyber insurance is something that's actually been subject to a lot of litigation and frankly the litigation has come out in a number of different directions it's not consistent so i uh, i think that the thing to take away with thinking about cyber insurance is to go into it carefully to know exactly what's being covered and what's not being covered um and and in in some cases to ask a lot of questions but also be really transparent with potential carriers about what your systems look like to see if those systems would even meet the baseline for uh coverage to be paid out if an incident happens so i think the next thing we want to talk about is disclosures i think that's ed you're up yeah thanks phil uh so the sec uh as shown on the slide has been focused on disclosure of cybersecurity and cyber attacks by public companies for some time now um in 2011 the division of corporate finance issued staff guidance basically saying two things uh that companies should you know, may be obligated to disclose cybersecurity as a risk factor and also cyber incidents if they are to occur. Um, following this guidance, most recently in 2018, the commission reaffirmed this at the commission level um, and basically expanded the guidance by also including statements to the effect that uh, public companies should also adopt cybersecurity policies and procedures. So, you know, that relates to public companies. Obviously, um, everybody on the call should know that uh, the SEC doesn't have jurisdiction with the exception of uh, an anti-fraud rule against uh, state and local governments. So how does this relate? Well, you know, uh, a, good, a, a good author of the treatise on the securities law of public finance, his name is Bob Fippinger. He wrote about 2,000 pages on the securities laws and how they relate to public finance. And in that treatise, he basically uh, analyzes the SEC's uh, rules as they're applied to corporations and public companies and how they would relate to a municipality or state local government. Um, so it's it's a good starting point since there are no rules uh, with the exception of that anti-fraud uh, provision. So I would say the more complex the state local government is, the more reliant the state and local government is on technology that could be attacked or hacked, the more likely uh, you could see disclosure in uh, the official statement about risk. Um, and this is something that's, you know, it's evolving, obviously. I, I think I've read some articles uh, in the bond buyer where more and more issuers are tending to put in at least a uh, blurb or a paragraph about uh, cyber security as a risk factor. It's something to consider um, when you're um, when you're in connection with an offering, and, and also it's something that we're seeing, at least on our end here in 
Texas, a lot of um, underwriters and rating agencies asking the question. So um, in determining whether to disclose, uh, you know, issuers should probably weigh the potential materiality of the identified risk. Um, and the case of a cyber incident, um, the importance of any compromised information and the impact of the incident on the issuer's operations, um, and also the range of harm that's caused by the incident. Uh, obviously, this is a delicate balance, though, uh, because if you are to disclose uh, anything in the in the offering document, uh, you don't want to provide a roadmap to potential hackers or uh, any other nefarious characters that are looking to exploit uh, that information and use it to their benefit. So this is uh, something that has been on the radar of the SEC. While it doesn't apply to um, it doesn't apply to uh, state and local governments at this time, it's certainly a, a practice that's evolving, and we're starting to see more and more of. And you should discuss uh, in connection with the primary offering um, whether disclosure should be included uh, with your disclosure counsel or bond counsel. Um, and I think that leads us to the end of our slides. And now we're going to go ahead and take a few questions from the audience. Um, it looks like our first question is, um, this is to either Phil or David. You mentioned some examples of payment processors being breached. Is cyber risk something that should be addressed in vendor contracts for services like that? Any thoughts on how to go about it? Yeah, this is Phil. I'll take the first stab at that. I mean, I think cyber preparedness is something that should be in all kinds of different vendor contracts. Um, you know, it's not just asking for reps and warranties from vendors about, um, you know, what cyber programs they have in place and providing assurances that they, you know, keep things up to speed. I would also, you know, when you're in a position of bargaining strength, and this doesn't always happen, but you know, it's not the craziest thing in the world to ask a counterparty for indemnification for any costs or exposures that come from um, you know, a cyber incident that impacts particularly you know, customer data or you know, constituent data when there is a you know, potential quantifiable uh, monetary loss that, that, that's in place. Um, you know, in lots of different industries, there are regulators that are uh, highlighting for regulated entities that uh, they should be paying more attention to vendors and to you know what kind of securities vendors can provide. There was even a uh, recent example where I think the CFTC fined a broker dealer or small financial institution because the uh, sort of cybersecurity vendor that the uh, company used made some mistake and essentially left a you know technical backdoor open that was used to you know obtain uh, investor financial information so uh, anything that can be done to strengthen uh, protections through vendors is, is probably a good thing i don't know david do you have any anything you'd want to add on that well i'll just echo what you said i think particularly large municipalities when you're dealing with pay, you know payment vendors is a great example and we saw one of those get breached you know i would want at minimum two pretty strong provisions in the contract saying you know one you need to keep me informed of your cybersecurity posture and in any incidents and then two as phil was saying an indemnity uh i would imagine a lot of it and i don't know this for a fact but i would imagine a lot of the municipalities eventually in that pay to gov incident had to pay for credit monitoring and some other things. And it's probably far from clear that the actual vendor was completely on the hook to pay for all of that. And I'll bet the, the cities did have to pay some. Great, terrific. Uh, looks like we don't have any more questions. Phil, David, do you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that the that the the most important step for for anyone who's not really you know steeped in this or thought about this before is just taking the first step and figuring out what you know what you don't know and how you can go forward to to get ready for you know whatever might happen however low level or high level and uh, you know 
be prepared to respond, to respond quickly and clearly, and um, and do your best to to train folks so that they can spot problems and report them up to to the right decision makers. Yeah, and real right. quickly from me, real one thing I'll just finally say is, in a lot of these cybersecurity contexts. There's no such thing as impenetrable target. Uh, I mean, if a determined enough and well-resourced enough adversary really wants to get into your particular systems, they will likely find a way. Um, and so none of this immunizes you. None of it, you know, means you can ever disclose to anybody that you have done every, that you, you know, you're completely isolated from cyber risk. But all of this from the very simple, very cheap things up to the very expensive things. Each of it is just taking slow incremental steps of making you a harder target that makes it less likely that a uh, somebody who's just looking to do this at volume and on the cheap is going to be able to do anything. And so don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel like you have to do all of this tomorrow. Each step you take makes it a little bit less likely you're going to suffer an incident like this. Yeah, and, and I would just echo that and, you know, uh, being diligent and, uh, you know, Understanding what's out there is, is, is important, and I think we kind of uh, we got a good framework here in this webinar for that. So I appreciate uh, the time of Phil and David, and we also greatly appreciate the time of all of you who joined us today. Uh, we'd like to thank you. And any questions, you can feel free to contact uh, either Phil, David, or I on this uh, either our contact information on the slide, or feel free to reach out to us on uh, on the internet. Uh, our contact information is there. Uh, Again, thank you for joining us, and uh, that's it. Bye-bye.